Hello and welcome back to a new lecture of our machine learning class. Today I will give Tim another break and talk about our first generative model of this lecture, the variational autoencoder. Let's start by categorizing machine learning models. So we talked about um, supervised learning before, but we didn't mention it. So supervised learning is when we have labels. So we have pairs that we train with, so pairs X and Y, and we try to map these pairs to um, the label, so to find the, the right label. And we have a clear objective of how to do it to do that. And the problem here is that labels are often very expensive. So what are we doing differently in unsupervised learning is that we don't have any labels. Um, you, we already talked about such algorithms, for example, clustering. We talked about dbscan and k-means, right? But they are multiple possible tasks that you can think of when we talk about unsupervised learning. For, exa for example, generation, you can do image generation. We will talk about this today. But there's also different other things you can generate, for example, text, music, and yeah, all different kinds of stuff. And the good thing about it is that it is very cheap. So how are we motivating of what we are doing today is, for example, if you have a dog image um, and you want to send that to your friend and actually have a low bandwidth. So what can you do? One thing that is something that you could obviously do is just compress that image, then send your friend um, that compressed image and also send your friend a way of decompress that image. And that way you send less information than not compressing. So do we already know a way of doing that? So we didn't talk about it back then when you talked about PCA, but PCA actually provides us with a way of doing it. So remember PCA was about calculating the principal components. So let's imagine we calculate the first M principal components and then we write them in this W matrix here as column vectors. And then we use that to project our X, so our input vectors, um, down to those first principal components as we do uh, in PCA. And then we write it right here and then we get um, something in Z space, a compressed image that we call ZM. Now in the unsupervised case, we actually call this the latent variable or the space where this lives in the latent space. So that is because um, we can think of as all these processes we are talking about, uh, we can think of this as black box me mechanism. So we don't know what is inside that mechanism, but we can see what is coming out and what we input. So that is something that is inside this mechanism and that's why it's kind of hidden, so to say, um, or the latent variable. So how do we, or what do we send our friend to be able to project that image back up is um, some kind of inverse function, which is not really an inverse function, um, but we send him WM transposed. And if we just multiply that back again to on top of our ZM, which is just this thing here, then we get some yeah, lossy image where we have some decompression loss, obviously. So how are we compressing images the mad data scientist way is <clears throat> crop and reshape all of the images that you want to send and to a common sense M such that you can apply PCA to them, then find a good number of compression dimensions M. Um, for example, in think about the case you have a 32 times 32 image that would be 1024 dimensions and choose M something, for example, 128. So this would be a significant compression, right? Then compress these images um, as we just talked about and then share your compressed images and the way of decoding them. So WM 
or you could also say WM transpose here with your friend. So let's take a look at of what we were doing from a neural network perspective. So a different way of writing this is to have these x1s till xn, so our input as input neurons here. And then the first step would be having our encoder, E that is defined by our WM matrix. And matrix multiplication is something like applying a linear layer, right? So we have the matrix variables here, or entries, the W11 to WNM, here that define a linear layer. And we project that down to our Z space, Z1 to Zm. And then back up with something we could call the decoder, WM transposed, again having these weighting here, and get something back which is called x tilde 1 to x tilde n. And now this is something that is looks really like a neural network and what is the difference here is that we don't have nonlinear activation functions. So this is just a linear projection and compared to neural networks um, they do something similar, right? So what are they, do they doing similar is that the neural network is obviously a nonlinear projection. So with the difference here is that our W11, and so our WM in that case, our linear layer, is not calculated before, in, like in PCA, but will be learned in the learning process. And the next difference is that we have nonlinear activation functions, FE and FD, that will be defined after applying the linear layer, so for our z-dimension or the latent dimension and for our reconstruction, that lossy image that we get back when we take a look at x tilde here. Okay, and how, so that would be a way of defining a so-called autoencoder and what would be a way of learning um, the parameters here for that autoencoder is just take the MSE, so the mean squared error or the Euclidean distance and put in um, your input image and see how far off you are with your reconstruction. That is, if you take your input and put that into your decoder and encoder and decode that again and see how good you were doing. And we can compare that with, to the PCA reconstruction. So do the same thing here, MSE, for the input and the reconstruction and in that way we can compare if we were doing better than PCA or not. Now I did I quickly did this um, for example with MNIST and compared both of them so I just implemented a single layer autoencoder and both of them had 128 latent dimensions and then I got this, for example, as a reconstruction of a 0, 1, 5, 2, and 4. And you see um, the reconstruction is quite good, but looks a little blur blurry here, right? The test loss is um, also quite low. Um, for PCA, we have a look at the reconstruction here. Looks almost similar to what we get here. Uh, so no big differences, but actually the PCA reconstruction was even a little better than what we were doing with the autoencoder here. So, yeah, even, yeah, a little better. So obviously we want to make things better than PCA with neural networks, right, when we learn something. So we are talking about deep learning, right? So what are we always deep, uh, making in deep learning is just making things deeper, right? So we talked about this in the last lecture, how are we going to make things deeper with convolutions and with pooling. So um, the general architecture that we propose here would be taking as an encoder, we have convolutions and unpooling to downsample the input. And for the decoder, we, we use transpose convolutions and unpooling to upsample again. But wait, transpose convolutions and unpooling, we didn't talk about this yet, so let's introduce it. So first of all, first of all let's talk about 
transpose convolutions or maybe let's talk about convolutions before. So remember the formula for the output dimensions. W prime was the output dimensions of a convolution was um, the number of input di dimensions minus the kernel plus two times the padding divided by the stride, round that down, plus one. Now we see that W prime is always smaller or equal than W. So the output dimensions are always smaller or equal than our W, no matter the choice of kernel padding or stride. So we see we can only use normal convolutions to be to downsample an input, not to upsample. Um, we have a small example here, what this would be looking like for a kernel of size 3 and an input of size 5. You see that in this case would be also be um, projected down. So how do we define transpose convolutions? The difference is here that for um, an, uh, applying uh, transpose convolutions, convolution we don't apply that on all of the input, in this case x1, x2 and x3, but just or on the on the kernel size of that kernel, but just on one input here, that would be x1, and we apply the whole kernel here, and we get three outputs. So you see the difference for convolutions, we had three inputs for kernel size three, we got one output, and here we have one input for kernel size three, and we get three outputs. So what is the calculation here? Y1 is now w1 x1, y2 is now w2 x2 x1, and y3 is now w3 x1. Like that. Now, going on here, what is the next calculation for x2? We do something similar, but now we slide that window over the output here on one step. And you see, you can interpret that as sliding the kernel over the output instead of what we're doing before, sliding the kernel over the input. And now we get the same calculation um, what we did for x1, we do for x2 here, right, this part. And we add that on top, but just shift it by one dimension, so to say, like that, such that we assign something new for y4 and add something on top for y2 and y3. So same thing again for x3, our last input. Um, same story again. We just slide the, the window down here again and then have some new um, summations here and a new assignment down here. So the same, it's just the same way what we did for x1. We have w1 x3, w2 x3 and w3 x3. Now let's take a look at this in terms of matrix notation. So you might remember this or yeah, you think this is quite similar to something we defined in the last lecture, right? So in the last lecture we talked about the Turplitz matrix and we actually see that this has some similarities here. So the, this could be our Turplitz matrix here. Um, this could be a convolution, just a normal convolutions for um, an input of size 5 and we get an output of size 3 here. We apply this um, convolution here with kernel size 3 and this is the Turplitz, Turplitz matrix, right? So we see that this could be a definition of convolution and now we see that the name transpose convolutions wasn't chosen arbitrarily but if we transpose that we get this W here, this W matrix which is just uh, our transpose convolution now, which is the, really the transpose of the matrix notation for a uh, normal convolution. So don't get that confused. We are mapping, now we are mapping things the, uh, just the opposite way, right? So from um, a dimension, uh, five dimensional space to a three dimensional space. And here we are mapping from a three dimensional space to a five dimensional space. But don't get it wrong. So 
W is not the inverse operation of a convolution. So I said that before that we can see this as um, sliding the window out over the output instead of the input. And let's have a look at what the actual output size is of our, of our transpose convolution. So we had that formula before, right? So um, one thing we can do here to calculate the transpose convolution formula is just, as I said, things get mapped the different, in a different way, right? So just in the opposite way. We just interchange, therefore, our w prime with our w and we get the formula for the transpose convolutions, just that here we have to rearrange that so that we have this formula in terms of w prime now. And we see that w prime is now equals the w minus one times the stride. So input dimensions times minus one times the stride plus the kernel minus two times the padding. And now we talk about unpooling. Let's have a look. So unpooling is um, yeah, very similar to, um, to what we do in pooling, but just in, the, in an opposite way. So same thing as for pooling, we don't have any learnable parameters here. Um, but there's something special about unpooling is that we always need a reference max pooling in the downsampling part, so in the encoding part, to have an unpooling layer in the decoding part. Why is that? So they always come in pairs. Why is that? We see that right now if we take a look at what pooling does again. So for example, max pooling was just taking the maximum in each. So this was max pooling with kernel size 2 and stride 2 was just taking the maximum position of the what the, what the kernel was over, right? So it was 9, 12, 5, and we just took the first 7 here instead of the second 7. Um, do you think, why does that matter? Because we are now defining how unpooling is defined, because we remember where from what kind of positions we are taking the maximum from. So we remember that position, this position up here, this position, and here the first position of the sevens. And what we are doing is taking that position. For example, if we would apply our unpooling on that small part here now, this would just meaning to remember the position. So we take that input, remember the position of what we were doing in the pooling layer, put that here, and yeah, same thing for the 12 and so on. And actually in the last kernel down here, we took the first seven. You can define this, this in a different way. Um, so if you, if you want to code that for yourself, uh, you could also say, I always take the last seven. We just, this is just um, yeah, something that is equivalent to, to this definition here. We, we say that we take the first seven. Now, what are the problems of our autoencoder? So um, we saw this before when I showed you the endless example that reconstruction are a bit blurry and that's due to the MSE loss. We can talk about this when we talk about next week in the Q, um, assignment Q&A. I can quickly show you why, why that is the case. And another thing that we might want here is um, the question of can we actually sample something here. So you might ask yourself, okay, we are now projecting into our Z space, so into our latent space. What is, so we have, for example, for our dog, we have this point in latent space. And now what, what is, if we take a different point, is that also a dog or is that not a dog? But the problem here with autoencoders is, with standard autoencoders, is that not every latent vector maps actually to a dog. We will see that in the next slide. So what are we doing? We are mapping some dogs, for example, this dog. We map that into Z space. All of the other points here are other dogs that we just mapped that corresponds to that vector in Z space. And then from there we upsample again. 
So we learn the decoder to upsample that particular point to have a dog again. And that is now a blurry image of what we inputted. But now you can ask yourself, what is if we take this different point? So this point, if you haven't seen the trans transition now, this point is actually a new point that we now got. And we can ask ourselves, is this also a dog? And we see that this might be, for example, could be something like a frog dog. And um, yeah, so it's not really a dog. But actually it's gonna be something much worse it's more likely to look something like this so it's more likely to just look some like some blurry image without really a dog on top of it and with just yeah, a bit of random structure that is maybe shared by all of the images that you just inputted so this is not really something meaningful in a way so yeah is there a way so um now we are thinking about how to generate something. So is there a way of doing that? So for that, we have to have a look at what we have been doing so far. So we were looking at points in dog space. These points, for example, we were projecting them down two points in latent space and then projecting that up again two points again in dog space. But now actually to talk about generative models, we have to first talk about something here and have a little bit different um, thinking here is that we need to think in terms of distributions now. So let's define the distributions that just define all of the points, yeah, all of these uh, parts here. As first of all, we have the true distribution, P of X which our dog samples are part of. And we can think of this as being the distribution over all possible dog images. And our data set, so our dog images, is just a sample of that um, distribution P of X. And our data set actually can never be all of P of X, um, so never be all of dog images, because there are much more, or like there's much more dog images that you can imagine. So there's infinity many, and you can't cover that with your data set. So next up is the prior distribution. So the prior distribution is of what happens if we take a look at a single dog point and project that down with our encoder into our latent space. And then if we think about this in terms of a distribution, this will not be just a single point, but this will be a distribution. So this is a distribution over all sets that are possible if you put in um, this point and apply your encoder, if you think about this in terms of a distribution. So um, yeah, the posterior distribution is defined of by um, p of z given x, so given your data points, or you can also take a few points in your data set. So given your training data or some evidence, so not all of your training data, but some, some training data, could also be all of your data, um, you get some distribution in the latent space. But if you take a different point or different data here, you get a different distribution in data space. So that is your posterior distribution. And next up is the prior distribution. So the prior distribution is where your posterior distribution lives inside. And in a way, your posterior distribution defines your prior distribution because your prior distribution is the distribution over all latents that you have. So you were sampling from the dog space and your encoder now defines how your latent dog space looks like, right? So a different encoder will give you a different distribution here. And yeah, P of Z is just a general distribution over all these latents.
Now, going from the P of Z, so going from your prior distribution and project some point up again with your decoder, you get the likelihood back of what you have when you have a decoder and neural network parameters of the decoder, so theta of D, um, and input some, some Z latent vector, use that to decode it and get some, get, get some image back, you can measure the likelihood of that image being a dog with that probability here. So that is P of X given Z and given the neural network parameters of the, your decoder, you can also just say D here. So given your decoder, the way how you trained it, and given your Z, you get back something in dog space. Or, yeah, you can evaluate if this is something that is in dog space or not. So how likely is this? So let's talk about the problem we had before, right? So we had this problem that we can't sample from our prior distribution, right? So what were we doing before? So for example, we had this we had our dark images that we were sampling down here, but we now took a random point and that this could be, for example, a point that lies here. So that is not part of our um, distribution anymore. And therefore, if we just project that up, this will not be a dark image anymore. So one thing we want to do, so we don't know our prior distribution, one thing we want to do is choose our prior distribution and choose our network in such a way that we know our prior distribution. And most of the time we want our prior distribution to be a simple distribution and when we say simple distributions we mean Gaussians and in this case we mean a standard Gaussian distribution that would be defined by this distribution. It would have zero mean and the identity matrix as covariance matrix. So this would be looking like this. And now, we, how, how do we do this? So this looks different now than our Gaussian distribution, right? Now, we actually want to make them the same, right? So if, we, so if they are the same, we can sample from our Gaussian distribution, of, from P of Z, sample something, and because we know this is uh, the, this, the latent distribution, we know that this corresponds, so every image inside this distribution, corresponds to a dog and if we upsample again with our decoder this will be a dog image. Now in order to make our prior distribution that way um, you remember that our prior distribution was in a way defined by our encoder right and our, our encoder is so to say our prior distribution. So our encoder defines our uh, not prior distribution our encoder and defines the posterior distribution, right? So we want to choose the posterior distribution in such a way that we know the prior distribution. Or in this case, in such a way that we that the prior distribution is a standard Gaussian. So how do we do this? So one thing is we take the approach of just calculating what the prior distribution is. So we could apply Bayes theorem here. So let me just write down what Bayes' theorem is again. So um, these are the steps for the Bayes' theorem. Is we had the posterior distribution, P of Z given X. And we just write the definition here. This is P of Z intersected with X divided by P of X. So this is the probability of observing Z and X at the same time divided by the probability of, of, of observing X. And this could be rewritten just um, just like that. The intersection sign is ac actually symmetrical, so the order here doesn't doesn't matter. We can change it like that. And then just the definition for this would be this here. So we get the Bayes theorem. This is from going from here to here, which is just says that p of z given x is p of x given z times p of z divided by p of x. Now, we know that this belongs to our encoder now, right? This is the posterior distribution. 
Now this thing here, I call it a likelihood, belongs to our decoder, right? So our encoder and our decoder define those probabilities here. Now, the only thing we need to know in this formula is p of x. So is there a way of calculating p of x? So a way of doing that would be um, just writing down p of x in terms of the integral. So the integral over z over the z space of p of z given x um, times p of z times our prior. Now, as I said, we know our prior or we want our prior to be this, the standard Gaussian. So from now on, when you see p of z, you always th think about it as being the standard Gaussian. Now, why is it hard to calculate that integral? So when we calculate integral, we can do Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo is just sampling very often um, and evaluating and then um, um, the more the often, more often you sample, the better your evaluation gets. And so something you would do is sample from your standard Gaussian, then put that through the decoder and check what, what you're out what the outcome is. And if this is actually a dog, and if you happen to hit a dog, this will have high probability. And if you happen to don't hit a dog, this will have low probability. Now the problem is that now Monte, I said Monte Carlo is really expensive, but there's another problem which is, makes this even worse, is that if we just random sample something here and decode this, this will most likely not be a dog. So this likelihood will always stay very low. Now what is the problem of staying very low? So if we want to need, use that as an optimization criterion, what would happen is that we would have very low gradients, so gradients that are close to zero, and gradients that are close to zero don't really help you to learn some, something. So we need to find a different way of doing this here. So instead of calculating our unknown posterior, we might approximate this with an easy distribution q of z given x and neural network parameters theta. So this theta already indicates that we want to use a neural network here. This is something really what we always do, right? Uh, if you don't know a function, so just approximate it with a neural network. This is our goal. Our goal is that our neural network that we now know actually is something that approximates our posterior. So is there a way of doing this or what could be a way? So in order to define an optimization goal here is um, we need to know how to make two distributions similar. So we need to measure some kind of distribution similarity, but how do we do this? So in order to measure distribution similarity, we need to talk about information theory. So you, this will, for most of you, will be just a quick recap, but I will do it anyway. So with cross entropy and with cross entropy, for example, we can measure something between the distributions P and Q. But let's first talk about um, the entropy here. So the entropy is the expected number of bits that you need on average to send if you want to encode a event that is given by some probability P of X. So this event could be looking like this. So you have 50% of the times you have sunshine and 50% of the times you have rain. And if you would encode that like this, so sending a zero when, it's sun, when the sun shines and sending a one when it rains. And um, yeah, this would just mean that you send one bit of information in both cases, right? Um, so, and we can calculate the entropy in this, in this case. This would be calculating um, the sum here instead of the integral because we only have a finite number of events, in that case two. And we just plug in the numbers here and get this calculation down here. So the 0.5 corresponds to 50%. We are taking a look at the logarithm of basis two here because we are talking about bits and we want to know the number of bits that we need. In optimization later on, we will use the, logarithm, the natural logarithm here and you will see why we use the natural logarithm instead of the binary log logarithm 
and, uh, and later slides. And so yeah, I'm going to talk about this later. And cross entropy, we need to refine that as well. So cross entropy is the expected number of bits that you need to send if you encode something with a model Q with, or with an encoding Q given some events that are distributed like P of X. So if we take P of X the same in our, the same events now and the same probabilities, so uh, same thing as before, 50-50 of sunshine and rain, and then we have some different encoding. Let's say we, we take this encoding scheme here, which would be 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. We actually never send that because we don't have a different event. Um, so this is a suboptimal scheme. Um, why is that? So um, this, these percentages down here in blue, um, they indicate, indicate what would happen if you would send just randomly send once in zero. So if you randomly send once in zeros here, you would send one one in 50%, uh, 25% of the time. One zero in 25% of the time as well, and a zero in 50% of the time. And we, if we plug that numbers in, in the cross entropy up here, and same, same way as we did here, we, get, we see that on average we send 1.75 bits of information. So we were doing much worse at, than in the, in the upper case here. So why did we talk about entropy and cross entropy? To now define the Kohlberg Liver divergence. So to remind you why we are doing this, we want to measure distribution similarity here, right? So we wanted to measure the distribution similarity between our posterior and our neural network now. So how is the kohlbeck liver divergence defined? Is it's just the integral over all data space of p of x times the logarithm of p of x divided by q of x. Now the interpretations of the kohlbeck liver divergence is there's there multiple, is that it is the relative entropy of P with respect to Q. A different interpretation is that it is the extra bits required to encode samples from P using model Q. And the third interpretation is that it is the information gain if P is used for sampling instead of Q. So we see that this is what's down here. So this is the cross entropy of P and Q minus the entropy of P. So the difference of that. Let's talk about the properties of the KL divergence. So um, uh, an important property is um, that we want to have for it being a distance measure or like a similarity measure, right? We want it to be positive and always greater than zero. And another nice property is that it is zero everywhere if and only if those probability distributions agree almost everywhere. What does almost everywhere mean is that they agree on infinity, on infinity, on infinity many points but on, they could disagree on finite many points. So um, this, the second thing is, so this is obviously a very nice property, right? So um, the minimum of this function is only achieved if those um, true probabilities agree. That's, uh, that's kind of nice. So the second property is that it is non-symmetric, uh, which is a bit unfortunate because it is not a metric in the mathematical sense now. So it is also not a distance measure in the mathematical sense, which is a bit unfortunate. But the third property is actually very important, is that it is convex. What does convex mean? Convex means, and this is very important for optimization, is that a local minimum is a global minimum, or is the global minimum. So if we have gradients that are zero for the KL divergence, we know that we hit the point where these two um, distributions agree. So if we are in the optimal spot, if we are done with our optimization, we should have the optimal similarity. Okay, so 
how do we use it? So again, we want to make those kind two distributions similar. So this was the posterior distribution and this was the distribution we defined our network, right? So this was our encoder now and we want to our encoder distribution to be similar to the posterior distribution. And what is the interpretation of that is to reduce the information gain between the approximation q of z given x um, when this is used for sampling instead of p of z given x, so instead of the posterior. And we just write down the integral, so the definition for that is we integrate over the z space and then q of z given x times log of q of z given x divided by p of z given x. And we further write it down now. So write down this as integral of over the z space of q of z given x times the logarithm of q of z given x. And now for at this part down here, we just remember the base slide we had before. We just put the definition down here. So this was p of x intersected with z times p of x. Now in, in the next line, we use the logarithm rule. So multiplication for logarithm becomes addition. And so we get this part here. And you see that this is not in the integral anymore. Why is that? Because we like the logarithm of p of x doesn't really depend on our variable we are integrating over. So we can take that out of the integral. And now we define we define that part to be our L, and this is now L plus the logarithm of P of X. So why do we, did we define that as L? Because minus L is actually the variational evidence lower bound called elbow. And why do we call that lower a lower bound? Is you see that here, if we rearrange that formula up here, we get that minus L equals the logarithm of P of X minus the callback liver divergence of q of z given x and our p of z given x. And as that is now because our callback liver divergence has this property that is, is always greater than zero. That is this is now smaller and or equal than p of z, p of x. And now um, we see we want to optimize this, right? We we said we want to optimize this. And because now optimizing means we are optimizing our Q here. And because our log, this part is constant in our calculation here, because this doesn't really depend on Q anymore of how we choose our network. So this is a constant term in our optimization. So if we want to make that bigger, we could just make our L bigger. So we could just make our, so just in order, or in uh, the other way around, in order to mini minimize that, it's equivalent to just minimizing our L. So we can write down our optimization criterion is that we are looking for the minimum minimal Q, so the minimal network that makes our L function, so the elbow minimal. So we need to further simplify our expression L, right? So L was defined like this. So it's the integral over Z space of Q of Z given X times the logarithm of Q of Z given X divided by P of X intersected with Z. And that is now we use the definition down here. That is just this. So it's just P of X given Z times P of Z. And then we use the logarithm rule here because one divide by something. So we say this is this part, those two things times one divided P of X given Z and one divided something and then taking the log of is minus taking the log of that what we had, that what we uh, were dividing before. So that is where the minus sign is coming from here. And we actually can also split the integrals here because the integral is additive. And then we have a look at what we have here. So 
This is the Kohlberg Liver divergence of Q of Z given X and P of Z. And this is the, you could say this is the cross entropy of um, Q of Z and P of Z, uh, of Q of Z given X and P of Z, X given Z. But we can also um, think about this as being the log likelihood of P of X given Z under the, dis um, dis uh, yeah, under the distribution of Q of Z given X. And so let's remind us again of what we were doing. So taking this argument here, so looking for the minimal network that minimizes this KL divergence, and, and we transform that now to minimizing, find the minimal network that minimizes this equation here, right? So this is the KL divergence of Q of Z given X and P of Z minus what we just talked about, um, the um, logarithm of p of x given z. And yes. So let's do a quick recap slide here. So what were we doing so far? So we were doing a lot of math, right? So, um, so I just want to remind you where we are right now. So we started with choosing or trying to enforce our P of Z, so our prior distribution, to be a standard Gaussian so that we can sample from it. And then, first thing we tried is to calculate our posterior to define our prior, but um, that really didn't work really directly, right? So we couldn't calculate P of X here. So the new idea was to approximate that with a neural network. So that is Q of Z given X and parameters theta. And we came up with this equation now is that um, in order to find such a neural network, we need to minimize the neural network parameters in order such that the KL divergence of Q of Z given X and P of Z minus um, the negative log likelihood of this part here actually gets minimized. So, um, minimizing the information loss is um, now actually equal to, so this part is now equal to this red part and this blue part, as we just talked about. And the red part here is just minimizing the distance of the prior distribution um, of, uh, and so the prior distribution that is now newly defined by our Q of Z given X, by our network, to the prior distribution P of Z that we, cho that we chose. And we can calculate that because we both know both, know both the this function and p of z that we chose that as the standard Gaussian. And this is the reconstruction loss we have here. This is the negative log likelihood. So why are we calling this the reconstruction loss? This might look very scary to you, but mm, so for example, for the auto encoder, we were taking the MSE here, right? So why do we not just take the MSE here to say to have something like the reconstruction loss? Now we are talking about this in terms of distributions, right? So we need to define everything we define here in terms of distribution as well. So mm, we define also, so this um, P of X given Z, I said this belongs to the decoder. So our decoder has also a distribution. So this distribution we define that to be also a simple distribution. So I said, whenever I said simple distributions, I mean Gaussian distributions. So we define our decoder to output a normal distribution of that, um, like that. So having a mean that is mu and having variance sigma. So our decoder needs to output two vectors. The first vector is the mean vector. So we input z and get the mean vector and then we input z and get the variance vector. So And then the next step would be sampling from this distribution. Now you might be wondering, so we are now in a multi-dimensional case, right? So you normally have the covariance matrix here. So we define in our case the covariance matrix to just be the diagonal matrix, so we don't have any covariances, right? So 
and we just have the variances on the diagonal and these diagonal elements we have n and we have n diagonal elements this is the same size as our mean right so this is also size n and we define the distribution now to look like this and then we sample instead of reconstructing our x directly we can sample our x from this distribution so this might be a little bit confusing so how do you think about this is you could also take the mean that you output here right there or that you output here up here for the decoder you can just take that as a sampling uh, as a sample uh, or as a reconstruction instead of sampling x tilde why is that because our mean actually in this distribution has the highest probability right so sampling the mean is always a good thing now we need to calculate this bad boy up here uh, in, order, in order to calculate that we need to write down how the distribution is defined so this is just the definition of what a Gaussian distribution would look like for one element right so we have a look at one output element xi so the ith element and this is um, defined like that so 1 divided by the square root of 2 pi times sigma i squared we input the z's here and then multiply that times the exponential function and inside the exponential function we have something like um, the xi minus the mu i's and we put the, in the mu mean we put the, the z vector again right and we square that and divide by the sigma i squared now we see up here we actually have to take the logarithm so what happens if we take the logarithm is um, the fraction uh, in front of the exponential function becomes that part here so this is just straightforward calculation and then the that's why we are taking the natural logarithm here remember I said we can take the the, the binary or the logarithm of basis 2 but we can uh, we in usually we take the natural logarithm here is because the natural logarithm and the exponential function they cancel so they are inverse of in a, of one another so the that's a nice property we have um, in that way we have here plus x minus the mu i um, squared divided by the variance and we rewrite that so we see this part is some just something like a regularization part that we just this just defined over the sigma i's that we output and get this part right so to calculate this thing because this is um, defined over multiple dimensions right we have to sum up all the dimensions so we sum up over all dimensions um, i equals 1 to n and we get this thing here now and now let's have a look at what the MSE would be defined for such a thing and we see that this is quite similar to what we were doing here right so I said so x tilde would be in our in the MSE case would be our reconstruction so I said the mean is something like the reconstruction so we can compare x tilde and the mean here and we see the difference here is that we have that regularization term here that is as I said not even defined by our mean which was our reconstruction so to say so this is a regularization term and for every dimension we divide by the sigma i squared so you can see as this as a weighted mean squared error so for every dimension we have is we have an additional weighting of that dimension that is defined by our variance so in a way you can say the how insecure the or how unsure the network is if the it maps the dimension right the bigger the sigmas will get here and another thing you can say if you if you would take just the identity matrix here so all sigma i's being one then this would be just the MSE here so let's get a quick overview again where we do we calculate those um, those losses I just talked about so let's have a look at the at this image again so we were um, 
yeah, putting our dark images into our encoder. Now we have this Q of Z given X because that we um, optimize it in such a way that this is the prior, to, uh, the posterior distribution. And now we, at this point, we um, have a look at the KL divergence that we just calculated and we optimize it in such a way that we, um, that we optimize our encoder here. And the next thing is that we sample from, from this distribution and get decode that again to get some dark images back. And to see if we got some good dark images or not, we use the reconstruction loss we just talked about up here. So this blue part. And we said just said that this is something similar as DMC. Now I didn't um, completely say how to calculate the KL divergence yet. So for our encoder, I said for the decoder, we defined a distribution now. And because we are talking about distributions, again, um, we need to define for the encoder a distribution as well. So um, this was our Q distribution. I didn't say yet how this is looking like. So we say this is also a simple distribution, again, a Gaussian distribution with mean mu of x and same thing here um, having a covariance matrix with diagonals sigma I, sigma of x and this is just writing it down in the multi-dimensional case how this looks like so if you plug that in into our KL divergence you actually get this here so m is the number of latent dimensions we have and this is one half times the sum of 1 plus the logarithm of the sigma i squared minus the mu i squared minus the sigma i squared. So you can do this as an exercise. And I think this is, it's not too hard to do it. And I think it's also, if you want to go in deeper into the theory here, it's also a nice exercise to do it. And also check if you understood some things of how to apply logarithm and how to, yeah, how to um, yeah, work with probability distributions and calculate something. Okay, so I think we still need to tell you again how what we are doing in the whole, so how the whole architecture looks like. So we take an X, so this would be uh, a doc image for example, and take that, put that into our encoder, then we get some mu i's and sigma i's, so a, a vector of mu and sigma. And now the question is, from here on, so we have two distributions now that we know and that define our latents, right? So one distribution is defined by our encoder, so q of z given x, and the other distribution we defined as being the standard Gaussian distribution p of z. So when do we use what kind of distribution? So that depends on whether we are training or not. Why is that? So Q of Z given X is living inside P of Z. So <clears throat> giving some X, the Q of Z given X is only the distribution of those sets that correspond to a specific X. So if we calculate the, or if we decode something that we sampled from a specific x and decode that, that should be something looking like something that we inputted again because we want to reconstruct x, right? <clears throat> and when we take p of z, so if we take our prior distribution, it's much bigger, much bigger than our, um, our encoder distribution that um, is dependent on x because inside of p of z lives all of the possible latents we have. So for example, if we have a zero digit, then we would this distribution would just be corresponding to zero digits in our latent dimension. And P of Z, um, the, the whole um, distribution over all of the latents obviously has more than zero digits inside. So there are encoded also the nines and the sevens and so on. So, how do we code this? So in NumPy, we take this line of code to sample um, from P of Z, and in PyTorch, we take this line of code. And as I said, now 
we don't need the encoder. For the sampling process, we can just sample from our prior distribution that was defined by our standard Gaussian. So we can just sample from that and plug that into our network again to reconstruct some or to sample some images. So let's talk about how the training process works. So forward propagation. Again, input your x, get u and sigma, and calculate the KL divergence loss. So if we outputted something really not belonging to the standard Gaussian, this will be penalized a lot. And if we calculate it that is inside the standard Gaussian, this will have a nice loss here. Then we sample z from that distribution in the training process. So that could be defined in NumPy like this. And then if we sam sample that, we plug that into our decoder, get mu and sigma again, and calculate the reconstruction loss. That, as I, was, as I said, is similar to the MSE. So we also need to talk about backpropagation. So how are we doing this? We start from our loss, and our gradient flows back through mu and through sigma, here back through our decoder network, back until we get to our z dimension, and now we get into a problem. The problem here is that these connections that were um, shown with these dotted arrows here, they are not really, they are not actual connections. So you can't differentiate through a random process, you can only differentiate through a deterministic pro process. That's why we can't calculate gradients here and can't backpropagate further here. So we need a way to circumvent this problem. And the way to do this is called the reparameterization trick. So on the left is shown what we were doing before. So sampling from mu and sigma with this distribution. This is not working out because we can't have gradients back here. But now we do something um, this way here, the, the, the reparameterization trick, which is defining the zi's as mu i plus sigma i, so what is coming out of the decoder, and now times some random noise, which is defined by a standard Gaussian. So why can we do this trick? This trick only works because, remember, we had this diagonal um, covariance matrix, right, that was defined by our sigmas. If we had covariances, so if we had values unequal zero, then somewhere else other than the diagonal, this trick would not work. So um, let's see how this turns out, uh, this trick turns out. So we actually have some deterministic connections here from the mu's and the sigmas, and our sampling process is now split from, from this process down here, so we can calculate them deterministically, and um, sampling is just split from what we do here. And therefore we can calculate gradients and flowback gradients. We don't need flowback gradients here, because we don't have any parameters here, but we can flowback the gradients here as usual, so this is nothing new compared to uh, normal neural network. So let's compare the latent spaces of autoencoders and variational autoencoders. So in this model we took an autoencoder, a deep autoencoder that was projecting MNIST, so 28 times 28 dimensions. So MNIST was the um, data set with the digits from 0 to 9 and we were projecting that down to two dimensions. Why two dimensions? that we, uh, we chose two dimensions such that we can show this as a graphic here and show where every point is mapped to. So we see that, for example, the 1s are mapped here, the 7s are mapped here, zeros are mapped here. And now we also see that the 1s are really spread out widely and the zeros are not, and the 7s again are really spread out. So the, stru the structure of the data is not really nice. So 
Um, the spread of the data, you also see it maybe down here, is also very huge. This can be go up to, this is not really bounded, really, so you can have data points up here maybe as well. So this is a really problem. Um, why is it a problem? Because, if, for example, if we take a look at this point, there's no data evidence around this point. So if we were going from this point and we're sampling points that were nearby, those points don't really correspond to something meaningful or something that can be upsampled again. And for example, if we want to interpolate here, so going from 1 to 7 and look at what is in between here in the latent space, all of the points here that are I don't have really data evidence around them, they don't really correspond to something that could look like a digit. So let's compare that to the variational autoencoder case. So again, as well as before, we take two latent dimensions here such that we can visualize them. And now uh, the same story here for if we only take the reconstruction loss, because I said the reconstruction loss is something really similar to the NSE. So this image would look the same here if we just take the reconstruction loss and train with that. Um, when we take the KL divergence, um, we, because we are making our encoder looking like a standard Gaussian, if we just do that thing, this would just look like random noise, right? So we, our encoder would just output random noise. This is also not really something meaningful we, we want. And now if we combine both of them, we get a really nice data structure. And you can also see that this is bounded. Um, I think this is somewhere between minus three and three. This was much, has had a much larger sp spread here. And the combination of both of them has a really nice structure. All of the classes have um, similar or comparable sizes now. And if we interpolate something, for example, from one to two, we have data evidence everywhere, right? So every point here corresponds actually to a point uh, or to a digit when we decode that again. And, um, and yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really nice, um, yeah, really nice data structure. So let's have another look onto this. This is the just the same thing, um, the projecting MNIST down to two dimensions with a variational autoencoder, just a different picture. So we are taking, we are remembering now the positions of what we have, what the, these um, digits correspond to in the latent space and project them up and put those images where they belong to in, in latent space, for example, um, in the center now, we project that up is the 8, and um, here are 6s, and so we just put those numbers where they belong in latent space, and then we can analyze this here and see how our latent space looks like. So this is quite interesting. For example, our mean of the latent space is an 8, and this is quite interesting because this also makes uh, quite, quite some sense, right? Because the 8 is actually a number that is quite similar to all of the, under, the other numbers. So, for example, if you re just remove a line, you get a 3. If you squeeze um, the 8, you get a 1. If you yeah, re remove some, some other lines, you get a 9. And you can get a 5 going to the left. And you can see here, this is a really nice picture, because you can see that you have smooth transitions between digits here. And that tells you that you have data evidence everywhere um, in this section of your late space. Now let's talk about the shortcomings of autoencoders again. So we said that autoencoders have blurry images and that clusters are far apart. That was why we couldn't sample from autoencoders. Now compare that to variational autoencoders. We still got, got blurry images here, but um, now our latent space, because why did we have blurry images here is because the reconstruction loss was something similar we used for autoencoders, right? Something similar um, to MSE. And our latent space is now really well structured and therefore we can use it as a generative model. So we can use it to sample something. 
let's summarize, summarize this lecture. So we talked about the autoencoder consisting of an encoder and a decoder. Um, they can be used to compress data and decompress data. And to train the autoencoder, we were minimizing a reconstruction loss, the MSE. And for variational autoencoders, we um, use them to, they can be used to sample data from a compressed distribution in latent space, and that compressed distribution was um, enforced to be a standard Gaussian, right? And how do we enforce that? Um, we enforce that uh, because we train the variational autoencoder to minimize the callback liver divergence between our Q of Z given X and P of Z, so between the prior distribution and the encoder distribution and the distribution that was defined by the encoder, right? Okay, let's conclude this lecture. I think this was a really theoretical lecture, so don't be afraid if you can't understand everything on the first view. This might take a while to, to understand. Um, but it's a variation autoencoder are really interesting. So compared to generative adversarial networks, for example, so guns, we will talk about them as well, they do a worse job in generating images. So um, you might wonder, okay, why are we even talking about variational autoencoder? But the concept of variational autoencoder is actually very interesting, and we are using this concept of a variational autoencoder in our lab, and we actually um, have some papers about, and we use that concept in some papers we, we wrote, and we will talk about um, what we did there um, with you in, when we talk about attribution. So stay motivated, even if this is um, looks like a little bit being a little bit different, uh, difficult um, on the first sight. And you will, I think, if you go into the assignment and um, yeah, have a little coding and go deeper into the theory, it will become much easier to understand. Um, you can co collect some questions, obviously, to ask me them in the next Q and A on Monday. And so we have two Q&As then, and we have much time to talk about all that you, that worries, uh, bothers you now. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs>